Hi there. Hey Sam. Hi. Just waiting for our writers to come back in the room. Hi Sharon. Hi Lou. Hiya. Hi Eve. Hi Eve. Hi yeah, you're all right. Yeah, lovely to have you all here. Um, so we just want to welcome everybody to our next um, panel around writing life balance. Um, just to give a bit of context, the Writing Around the Kid project is for mothers of young children to connect with writing creatively. Um, we're currently working with a brilliant group of women in Hastings in partnerships with Hastings Museum and New Writing South, and also have participants who are watching tonight from our Writing Around the Kids groups that we have in Crawley and in Littlehampton. Um, both Sam and myself are writers and mothers, and we began the project having recognised in our own lives how difficult it is to forge time for yourself to do something creative. And um, so I'm Anna Jefferson. I'm a playwright and novelist. I've written for stage and screen since 2005. Um, I've had two novels published, Winging It um, in November 2020 and Nailing It in April last year, both with Orion. Um, my third book is currently in with my agent at the moment, terrifyingly, and I'm just working on my fourth book at the moment. Thanks, Anna. Um, my name's Sam Johnson, and I'm a freelance writer. I've got an MA in creative writing from the University of Brighton, and I've been facilitating creative writing workshops since 2017. Um, I've got po poetry published in a few anthologies, and I've had work in the Brighton Fringe Festival. And I'm very slowly writing a novel whilst, uh, well, around my children. <laughs> That's me. So we're really delighted to welcome you tonight to this panel discussion. Um, we've got three exceptional uh, writers with us and they've kindly agreed to share their time and their experience of what it is to be a writer. Um, and they're also gonna do a reading uh, from their work, which is very exciting as well. So uh, first off, I'd like to welcome Lou, um, Lou Tonda, so after doing a creative writing MA at the University of East Anglia in the noughties, Lou published The Water's Edge and The Haven Home for Delinquent Girls with Headline Review. Did a PhD, travelled around the world, started a family and became a creative writing lecturer. Um, since then, she's supported countless numbers of writers through mentoring and editorial feedback. Unusual Places, her first short story collection came out in 2018 and she's currently working on her next novel. Lou lives near Brighton on the sunny south coast of England and teaches for the Open University and also blogs at uh, louisetonda.co.uk. Hi Lou. Hiya. Um, I'm going to read from my short story collection which came out a few years ago now. Um, it was written in um, unusual places. Uh, I actually went to the place and sat, sat there and wrote the story. So I had um, a few rules. There had to be somewhere to shelter. There had to be somewhere to get tea. Um, it had to be free to get into because I had no money when I was writing it. Um, and um, what was the last rule? Oh, yeah, it had to be quirky or unusual sort of place you wouldn't normally go. So mostly they're in London because I was living in London at the time. Um, and this one I wrote in a park in Islington. And... I, I'm fascinated by plastic bags that get caught in trees and I always wonder where did that bag come from and who owned it and what was in it and um, and why did they let go of it and where's it been and I thought wouldn't it be good to write a story where the um, plastic bag um, got involved with various characters before flying on to the next character. So, so there are various characters in this story, but you only meet one of them because I've only got five minutes to read, but look out for the plastic bag. <laughs> um, and um, I'm really sorry if you haven't had your tea and this makes you hungry. <laughs> so I realized when I was practicing it, it's got loads of food in it. <laughs> a, profess a professional picnicker meets her true love. I am a professional picnicker. I picnic freelance and write for magazines about it. Pretty soon after I started, marketing departments and PR companies got interested and now I try out their products for a fee. Kitchen, kitchen equipment, food storage products, luxury picnic items, that kind of thing. It isn't just a job. 
I prefer it anyway to take my food outside where the flowers are deep baby blue pom-poms and pink and white triffids or where sluttish tulips shake their heads like dogs with long ears next to ink drop scented pansies. I go all over London spreading out my cloth in Camden, Islington, Wandsworth, St Paul's, Vauxhall, Highbury. Sometimes I'm near a river or a lake or a church, sometimes a park with a pond. I shared my biscuits with a peacock once. I like places with picnic tables. I slide my legs over the rough wood and set my food out in front of me. Smarties in a pot, a banana, some nice crisps from Waitrose, the ones with elaborate names, organic sea salt and cracked pepper, lemon and haddock, that kind of thing. Sandwiches with their crust cut off, maple syrup and apricot or goat's cheese, walnut and spinach, peanut butter and strawberry jam, avocado and figs and biscuits. I have tea in a flask. When I drink, I can see my reflection in the bottom of the metal cup. I had a picnic in January once. There was ice on the puddles. The pond was frozen over. I could see orange flashes underneath the surface. I hoped the goldfish were still alive and that their bodies weren't floating around lifeless down there, their souls unable to escape through the ice to fish heaven. Is there a fish heaven? Or does everyone go to the same heaven? There are no fish churches, temples, that kind of thing, I think, sipping my drink, looking at my face in the cup again. No fish vicars or confessionals, or perhaps they are there under the lily pads out in the middle of the ocean. How do we know for sure? But surely fish can live for years and years have winters in them. Fish hell would smell of chips and there would be no water anywhere, but only constant flapping, useless opening of gills, no dead relief, only dying open mouthed. When I went on my winter picnic, the ground was hard and white. The bench I sat on was cold. I wore my coat with the fur collar. I made hot chocolate instead of tea and had sponge cake instead of a biscuit. I had a picnic in a park by a river once on a warm spring day. I spread out my blanket and people noticed me, nodded and smiled because they could see I was so organized. The check cloth, flowers for the center, bread on a foldable board to make sandwiches, a bowl for fruit, the smart silver flask, the picnic hamper with sections for the special knives, forks, spoons, even glasses, wrapped in tissue paper, plastic plates tied to the lid, a salt and pepper shaker. People who only had a plastic lunchbox watched me jealously. The birds were singing to the flat leaves of the trees nearby and a squirrel circled the trunk round and round. I'd only just finished setting out my hamper when a blue plastic bag flew past me towards the river, the cheap kind you get in newsagents. I hate it when people drop rubbish. I am a responsible picnicker. I take my rubbish home folded into my hamper. Some people throw cans, crisp packets, half-eaten apples, all sorts, all along the riverbank. I found a shoe once and half a can of beans. I chased the plastic bag all the way down to the riverbank but it twirled off into the sky and I thought I had lost it. Mm. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much, Lou. Um, next, we're going to introduce our next writer who is Eve Ainsworth. Hello Eve, lovely to have you. Hi, uh, lovely to be Hi. here. So Eve is an award-winning award and Carnegie nominated children's author for both middle grade and teen readers. She's a vast experience working as a public speaker and creative workshop coordinator for schools, libraries and other events, both nationally and internationally. Eve was born and raised in Crawley, West Sussex, and is one of seven children. After her degree, she had a varied background working with HR and recruitment roles before landing a job she loved, mentoring, supporting, challenging and vulnerable students in a large secondary school. This inspired her first team, her first team book, Seven Days. Eve is fiercely proud of her working class roots and her crazy loud family. She lives in Crawley with her husband, two young children and crazy dog. Her first uh, novel for adults, Duckling, was published by Penguin Random House this spring. Um, so Eve, you're going to be reading from Duckling as well, aren't you? I am, yeah. So you get an uh, uh, insight into Duckling. We're coming out next week in paperback. So would it be nice to give a reading? 
as long as I can do it. <laughs> Would you like me to like read the blurb and then maybe if you can give, yeah, give it in lovely. a bit of context of the bit that you're going to be reading, is that okay? Thank you. Okay, so Duckling. Duckling's a nickname Lucy has never been able to shake off. And if she's honest, maybe it suits her. But just isn't the type to socialise with other people. You might say she's reluctant to leave her nest. Lucy's life is small but safe. She's got a good routine, but that's all about to change. When Lucy's neighbour asks her to look after her little girl for a couple of hours and then doesn't come back, Lucy is suddenly responsible for someone other than herself. It takes courage to let the outside world in and Lucy's about to learn there's much more to life, but only if she's brave enough to spread her wings. Wonderful. Oh, Over to you, thank Eve. you, Anna. So beautifully read. Now I've got to try and uh, keep up to it. <laughs> and I have to apologise because Lou was really good and she timed hers and I didn't. So I hope I don't whittle on too long. So do let me know if I go on too far. I'm going to start right at the beginning because it just felt like the best thing to do with this one. Just leap straight in. So chapter one. I thought I was alone when I buried the creature, but someone was silently watching my every move. The sun had only just begun to rise, stretching its weak fingers of light across the pokey strip back garden. The air was still sharp with the scent of morning dew, and the grass felt swidgy and damp beneath me as I moved barefoot across the lawn, clutching the bloody ruins close to my chest. I chose a small patch of soil at the rear of the communal lawn, sheltered from public gaze by the over, overgrown conifer that towered over the space in a jumbled knot of branches and leaves. It was an ideal place to conceal the body. No one would come down this far in the garden. Most of the residents chose to lie further up on the yellow patchy grass, spreading out their towels and blankets and letting their kids run loose, belting footballs against the low brick walls, or climbing the spindly trees that were clinging to life nearest the road. This was a no man's land, unloved and unkept, the scraggy ass end of the garden that only stray cat, that even stray cats avoided. There were a couple of old beer cans and grey scraps of paper discarded on the ground that I pushed to one side as I dug quickly with an old fork that I'd snatched from the kitchen on my way out. The weak metal was bending uselessly against the solid clay. I held up the wonky times against the watery light and cursed. Then in frustration, I threw the tool to one side and used my fingers to rake at the ground instead. The result was a scrappy, gappy, gapy mouth in the earth, ready and waiting for its offering. I hesitated for a moment, a tremble forming. I wouldn't want to be buried like this, I thought, staring blankly at the dark hole. I laid him carefully in the newly dug earth, my fingers working further to make the space a little bigger. He looked quite peaceful, if that was possible. Snug, certainly, a lot more presentable than when I first found him, splayed out on my kitchen floor, his sorry little eyes blinking up at me in bewilderment. There was a sharp intake of breath behind me. It made me jump back a little. I didn't know what I was expecting to find there, but it certainly wasn't the little girl. She stood there quite squarely, her hands planted on her hips and her teeth chewing on her bottom lip. What are you doing? She asked me accusingly. I was suddenly conscious of how I must look, crouching down there in the mud, wearing an oversized grey Madonna t-shirt and a pair of bright pink holy tracksuit bottoms. I pushed my hand through my scraggly hair, managing to drag dirt into the roots and pulled uselessly at the t-shirt. Quickly, I put my glasses square back in place and tried to make myself appear remotely normal. The little girl was dressed in her pyjamas and her long hair was loose and messy, sticking up like candy floss around her face. Her cheeks were pink with the cold and round and bright like ripe apples. She was wearing shiny green wellies that seemed to be on the large side. It made her feet look strangely fat and not at all fitting with the rest of her skinny frame. I blinked, realising who she must be. I had met the girl only briefly outside our flats as they were moving their belongings inside and I was leaving for my normal shift at the bookshop. The young woman, who I assumed was her mum, had blurted out a quick greeting, certainly nothing memorable. If it had been, because right now I couldn't for the life of me remember either their names. I really needed to get better at this. You've just moved in next door, haven't you? Ruby, the girl frowned a little. I'm Ruby. I nodded. Ruby, that's right. Of course it is. And your mum? Cassie. Yes, Cassie, I said. I knew that. But of course I didn't. I could only just recall her face. A young woman, skinny with blonde hair long delicate eyelashes and glossy lips that were plump and rich with sparkle. So what are you doing outside in the garden so early? And why are you digging in that mud? Ruby's eyes widened suddenly. Are you burying treasure? I stared back at the ground at the discarded bent fork and the rusty beer can. How long have you been watching me? I asked. 
Only a bit. I woke up and I couldn't go back to sleep. Then I saw you out here creeping around. She stepped forward so that she was next to me. She smelt faintly of lavender. What are you doing? Are you looking for something special? I sighed and then shifted to one side so she could see the half-concealed grave. What was the point in trying to conceal it? It wasn't like I was doing anything wrong. I poked at the hole, trying not to dislodge my offering. I was suddenly envious of the bird, tucked away securely in the mud, more or less hidden from view. He'd never have to explain himself to a small child in Wellington boots. Well, I said, I'm just burying this thing. She moved closer. I could feel a breath of hot air on my neck. Oh, what is it? A bird, a baby, I think. Oh, it's all gross. Where did you find it? In my kitchen. I paused, feeling unsure. I glanced over my shoulder, checking behind me. I thought I was alone out here, but perhaps I was mistaken. Could anyone see me? What if someone was peering through their pokey window, sneaking a quick fag and staring down at the view below? What would they see here? A crazy neighbour out in the early hours, digging around in the mud. Should I even be talking to this girl? A stranger, really. Was it appropriate thing to be doing? Maybe we should go back inside, I said. I'm not sure you should want to see this. It's not nice. And it's cold out here. Wouldn't your mum be worried about you? Ruby didn't seem to hear me and peer further forward. I thought I saw the slight flinch as she neared the broken body, but she didn't pull back. Instead, her forehead crumpled into a small frown. Is it a pigeon? She asked. Yes, it is. Or rather, it was. I scooped more earth and scattered it over the grey, bloody body. My Boris has always had a thing for birds. He really doesn't like them much. I think they annoy him. Is Boris your cat? That's a funny name. She paused. Isn't he named after that man on the TV? The Prime Minister? Oh, no, I don't think so. My fingers toyed with the loose crumbs in the mud. The rescue home men did not me. My mum said that man has funny hair, Ruby said. She calls him bad words when she thinks I'm not listening. I thought of my pampered cat, now probably lazing on his chair, his own fur a mass of uncombed fluff. I couldn't deny there were certain similarities between him and the two Borises, but I was pretty sure our Prime Minister didn't hunt for birds in the early hours. At least I didn't think so. I peered up at the little girl who was staring back so intently at me. I think she was waiting for me to say something. Oh God, I'm no good at this. What was I even meant to say to a child? I had no experience of this sort of thing. So, um, do you like cats then? It seemed a daft thing to say, but really, what else could I talk to her about? Cats was a safe topic of conversation. Oh, yeah, I love cats. I've got four. I keep them all in my room on my bed. Well, cats are great, I agreed, but I could have said more, of course. I could have bored a silly telling the millions and one reasons why I thought cats were the superior species, but I didn't. In truth, I was hoping that this conversation would end quickly and I could return to my happy isolation. I think they're cute and clever, and I don't let anybody mess with them, Ruby said, prodding the mound of earth with her tiny pink fingers. I nodded. Well, yes, they are cute, especially Boris, even when he brings me a dead pigeon at six in the morning. Do you wake up early too, she asked. Well, not normally. Boris woke me up with his loud meow, and I knew he was up to something. In truth, I'd give anything to be still in bed. My mornings were usually as lazy as possible. My shifts were always in the afternoon, so I visited Dad on my way to the way to the shop in the late morning it meant that I'd have time for relaxation and time to myself Ruby crouched further down her hair swinging forward thick and tangled she sighed loudly poor little bird do you think he was hurting a lot before well I don't know I don't like to think he was in any pain I continued to cover the bird up moving quickly now I expected Ruby to go away I kind of hoped she would but instead she lingered beside me breathing heavily through her mouth just watching Are you sending them to heaven? Is that what will happen now? I smoothed over the rough earth. There was nothing there, not even a lump in the ground. Before long, this bird would be swallowed up by the earth and forgotten, not a trace left behind. She's in heaven now, duckling, looking at you from the clouds. He'll be okay, I said, slowly standing up, ignoring the sharp spike of pain in my legs and the dull ache in my calf. I needed a shot of caffeine and some more sleep, preferably another eight hours curled up beside Boris. What I wouldn't give to live the life of a cat. It must be so much simpler not to have to worry in the world. I began to move back to the flat, my body heavy. Ruby remained behind, her head dipped towards the grave. Her body turned away from mine. You should get back to the flat now. Your mum will really worry, I said. You should talk to her about this sort of stuff, heaven and that. 
I reached the gate that led out to our share garden, directing the path towards our mon monolithic block. I was ready to go inside, but something instinctively pulled me back. The thought of Ruby standing on the own by the grave made me shudder. It didn't seem right somehow. I turned around. I'm sure you shouldn't be out here on a, your own, I said. It's too early. Wouldn't your mum wonder where you are? That was an assumption. Maybe it was fine for kids to be out on all hours. For all I know, she was quite happy for her daughter to be outside with all fitting boots and unbrushed hair. There was no reply. I waited at the gate, my fingers pinching the wood. For goodness sake, this girl wasn't my responsibility, yet I felt awful walking away and leaving her there by herself. Shaking my head in frustration, I found myself turning back towards the girl. Come on, I said. Why don't you come inside with me? I don't want your mum to worry. Ruby shrugged, still turned away from me. It's okay, she's still asleep. She won't be for much longer, though, will she? She'll wake up and find you're gone, and then what she will she think? Ruby shook her head. It's okay, really it is. Still, I prefer it if you came. All right, then. She turned, and we both walked down the narrow path towards the building. My mum knows I have trouble sleeping. Sometimes I go to bed, and sometimes I get up early. That's just me, she grinned. But it's safe here. Mum knows that. She says we're safe now. It's all good now. She waved and continued to skip along the path. I hung back a little bit, unsure if I should follow too closely behind her. The cool air went behind me as I watched her slip back inside the warmth of the building. She was safe. A sense of relief washed over me. Now I could get back to my own safe life. Thank you. <laughs> I love that because um, I, I've now I've read the whole thing, like the foreshadowing in that first chapter. It's like, oh, exciting. I know what's going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, and yeah, our last but by no means least, I'd like to welcome Sharon Duggle. Um, and Sharon writes novels and short stories. Her second novel, Should We Fall Behind, was um, published in 2020 and was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature's 2021 Encore Award and selected for Between the Covers, BBC Television's flagship show uh, about books and also chosen as Prima Magazine Book of the Year. Her debut, The Handsworth Times, was the Morning Star's Fiction Book of the Year 2016 and selected as the Brighton City Read Choice for 2017. Her short fiction appears in a number of anthologies Sharon is also one half of Radio Refurb's The Reuben and Sharon Show, the UK's only radio show with a mum and son presenter team, and she's currently working on her third novel. Hi, Sharon. Hi, hi, Sam. Hi. hi. So you, um, you're going to read from uh, Should We Fall Behind, so, um, and I'll just introduce the, uh, the book for you. So uh, Jimmy Noon, young, troubled and homeless, is searching for Betwa, a friend he found and lost on the busy streets of a strange city. His search leads him to Shifnal Road, where he encounters a collection of people who have settled in the area from places across the world. They live side by side, yet hardly seem to notice each other. Jimmy becomes the catalyst for their lives colliding, and as journeys to the street and to the city are retraced, so too are their stories of lost dreams, unrivaled friendships, stifling grief and profound love. Uh, Should We Fall Behind is about the passing of time and the weave of joy and suffering, love and loss, which shape human life along the way. It's about people who have some who have somehow become invisible and how their stories make them visible again. So if you just want to um, let us know kind of whereabouts in the story that you're going to read from, that'd be great. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sam. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to read um, a little bit from chapter five and, and a bit like Eve. I don't know how long or short this is. <laughs> well, actually, I know it's quite short. So if it feels too short, I might just read a little bit more. Um, and so this is, um, so one of the people Jimmy meets when he, um, or comes across or encounters when he moves to Shifnal Road um, is, is a young single parent called Abeli. Um, so I'm gonna read a, a little bit from where we first meet Abeli. Chapter five. Abeli Mangaru loathed Nikos Macredis. She hated the smell of vinegar and stale tobacco on his breath and the way the old man moved like a sloth across the shop floor. Minutely adjusting cushions and bedspreads and sweeping away dust from the tabletops with the heel of his palm. The sight of blue veins protruding from his salmon colored scalp, visible between diminishing strands of hair, made her skin crawl. She hated his drooping jowls and the way his words spat at her through a reservoir of phlegm. Each workday, she dragged herself along Black Horse Lane, 
up to St Anne's Road, past the big old pub on the corner, to the fusty furniture shop where she worked. MacReady's was always waiting, staring at the old-fashioned clock on the wall when she stumbled in, tutting, looking her up and down, as if she was something a dog had pulled from an undergrowth. You're late again, Mangaroo. And then always after a short pause, always the same threat. You know I can find better staff than you. Why don't you then, she muttered under her breath. And even though she knew he couldn't hear her, he'd say, if this happens again, I will replace you straight away. Then he'd reel out a list of tasks, which always began with wiping down the furniture before any rare customer arrived. Abele's little girl, Tuli, was almost two when they first moved into the flat owned by Nikos Macridis. They'd been thrown out of the last place when Tuli's father disappeared one night without warning. He left with his guitar slung over his shoulder, off to a gig at the tram shed, and she expected him home past midnight, but this time he didn't show up at all. After 24 hours, she thought about reporting him missing. Anything could happen in a big city. She'd once heard of a man being pushed into a canal at night, a man who, like Tuli's dad, looked like he'd come from somewhere else, even though he'd, he'd been born just over the river. She tried to call him, but his phone went straight to voicemail. She rang all the people she knew. There weren't very many of them, not now she had Tuli. She called the tram shed and put a message on Facebook, and then he blocked her, and she knew he was alive and just a bastard like the other men she'd known in her young life. Tuli stopped looking for her father two days later. And after the crying and the vodka ran out, Abele decided to follow her tiny daughter's example. She couldn't pay the rent on her own, not with a part-time job in Iceland and the cost of the childminder. The landlord wouldn't accept the benefits she now had to depend on. So she took what was an offer in a part of the city she knew nothing about. MacReady's flat was cheaper, but bigger than the previous place. It was obvious why. Powdery mildew teetered up from skirting boards like a medieval disease. When she first moved in, she scraped away the mildew and washed infected parts of the wall with water and bleach, but it kept coming back. She complained to MacReady's again and again, and each time he told her a man would be around to deal with it. But no one ever came. She slept with the window slightly ajar, even in the depths of winter, so the air would circulate and stop Tuli from getting a cough. The window in the kitchen was par partially obscured by shelves filled with pots and pans and dried food, so it was difficult to open, and cooking smells accumulated, permeating the flat with an undertow of rotten grease. She guessed that before the house was split into two, before the house was split into two, the kitchen had been a third bedroom, big enough for a single bed and not much more. The bathroom was small too, with just enough room for a bathtub, toilet and sink, and just enough floor space to stand to brush teeth or hair in front of the mirror. But the flat was home, regardless of its shortcomings, and the rent was manageable with her shop wages and tax credits and other bits and pieces she could cobble together. Iceland relocated her to Grand Parade, but when it closed down and became yet another betting shop, it was Mrs MacReadis who suggested her husband give a ballet the job at the store. She has a little one to care for all by herself. We should show some kindness. She spoke in their own language, but a ballet got the, ship, the gist and was grateful. The job was part time. Mrs MacReadis set the rules at first and it was flexible around the holidays once Tudy started school and it kept the DWP off her back. Abele found ways to make it work. Leave it, leave it there. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, wonderful. Sorry to bring it down a bit. <laughs> thank you, Sharon, and, and, thank, and also even Lou, it just all so beautifully read. And it's, yeah, it's a real treat to hear novels read by their authors. Um, so this evening we have, um, we've been speaking with our writers in Hastings to see the kind of things that they would like to speak with you about, to find out about. Um, so we have got some questions, but for um, anybody who is watching, if you have a question for any of our writers um, around kind of like writing life balance or anything really, um, 
anything writery, then please pop it in the Q and A, and we will um, we'll, we'll kind of ask them as we're going along. Um, so yeah, so I'll kick off. Um, so yeah, we're talking about writing life balance. So I guess the big thing is, how do you make time for yourself to write? I mean, do you? Is there a balance of working and writing, or do you solely write? What do your how does it work? How, how, how do you make writing work for you? And it'd be lovely to hear from all of you, but I'll just, if I just asked to start with, um, yeah, Sharon, um, could, could we ask you and then please everybody just dive in. Yeah, that's because I switched my microphone off first, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> in anticipation, <laughs> uh, because I'd, otherwise I'd just forget to do it and start talking. <laughs> um, so the, I feel like a little bit of an interloper here because my kids are older now and they've left home. Um, my youngest has just, just gone off to university. But um, when I was writing this book, or uh, should we fall behind, it was uh, while well, I was editing it during the pandemic and they were all home. And, you know, there was a full house again and um, the library was closed. The library, all the libraries were closed, obviously, and the swimming pool was closed. And they are the two things that I absolutely depend on to kind of keep me balanced when I'm writing. So I write in the library, in Hove Library, or which is in Brighton and Hove, or Hancock Library, which is near me, um, just up the road in a different part of Brighton. Um, and I go and, and I work part time. So on the days I'm not working, at least two days in the week, I'll go to the library and I'll get there for 10 and I'll stay there for five and I'll look at my computer screen and sometimes I'll write three words and sometimes I'll write a thousand but it's usually you know, the three words but I have to go out the house you know that that's how I make time really yeah at the moment um, if I see the domestics then you know I'm distracted by them even with the kids not here so you know I, I kind of have to feel like I do it like a job, which isn't to say that it's taking all the creativity away from it. I just need to be around the sort of buzz of other people doing stuff. And I think because like Eve, I come from a big family and uh, I'm used to that kind of background noise. I can't work in silence. Um, and I don't even know if I've answered the question, but. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, I think so. So libraries seem to get quite heavily, you, you know, having a different space that's not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and having a space where there are other people that yeah. aren't my people that I am responsible for. Yeah. Does that <laughs> resonate with, with either of you, Lou and Eve? Um, yeah, it kind of does and it doesn't. So, I mean, you know, we've got similar backgrounds, me and Sharon. So, you know, I definitely, I quite like noise. You know, I'm quite used to it. Um, you know, coming from a big family, it's all I've ever really known. So silence for me is quite, I struggle with it. And actually libraries, I really struggle working in a library environment. <laughs> I just do. I just, I sit there and I get quite intimidated because I see all these people working around me. And I just think, oh my God, I can't do this. Um, and what's interesting for me is that when I, um, when Seven Days was written, my first book, and I actually used to write that, I've said in other panels before, I actually wrote that when my daughter was being bathed by my husband so he'd come home from work he'd bath Ella and I would do my little bit of writing that was my time because I was working full-time I had a little girl um Ethan was a little baby then so that was my half an hour writing and I used to write it just before EastEnders so EastEnders was my reward um, and I wasn't allowed to watch it until I did my half an hour so I'd always sort of like give myself a reward at the end of it to keep me going um and when when um Seven Days came out I actually went full-time writing and you know was there forever a bit more and I actually really struggled to write because I had too much time and I would find that I was faffing around a lot more and I was you know looking at right move or Facebook or going for long dog walks or doing whatever I could do that was procrastinating and not doing my actual writing so I actually benefit from working so I've gone back into work now and I work uh, four days a week I have a day off to write but my day off to write isn't a, a day of writing because I can't do that. So I have to literally give myself like an hour or, or some restricted time where I make myself write and then I give myself a reward. I'm still so childlike, it's ridiculous. I think that this comes from being the youngest child. I have to have rewards. I have to be 
given something. So whether it be a biscuit or you can now go and sit in the sunshine for five minutes or I have to give myself a reward for doing my writing. So I'm a bit crazy like that, but that's how I do it. That's how I fit it in with work and children and crazy pets. I just slot it in to actually allocate your time and I try and make myself write you know a certain amount of words a day so that I know that I've done it it's almost like quite a regimented process but I think it's just what works for my brain because otherwise I'd just I'll just sit and daydream all day long and it just doesn't get me anywhere yeah it's interesting that isn't it that for um that uh, having those different targets instead of it being sitting somewhere for a period of time it's a a word count and knowing that yeah, that that's, yeah. that's once you got to that point, that's you, you can kind of reward yourself and you've you've got through that first bit. It's, but some yeah. people hate that. Some people hate workout targets, but everyone's so different. I've got friends that absolutely hate workout targets, but, but for me that works. That tends to be if I know I've written that much a day, I can feel really happy with myself. Even if it's a load of rubbish, I'll go, I'll edit it later. I'll worry about that later, but just knowing I've got the words down, that's that's the thing for me to try and to try and get it out. What about you, Lou? How do you how do you work? How do how do you kind of spot it all in life? Oh, it's kind of evolved over time, really. Um, I have an interesting relationship with silence as well because my parents owned a hotel. So I grew up in a hotel, so I could always hear people behind the the doors in their rooms. So I've got one brother, so our family wasn't that big, but it but there are a lot of people occupying the space. So. Um, I do like to know other people are in the house. I suppose that's a sort of dark, deep psychological need. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, when I first, when I wrote my first novel, I took half an afternoon off a week from work. I was teaching then, I was a drama teacher. And then from that point on, I think I've always taken either half a day or a day a week um, until I got my my full-time job as a creative writing lecturer. And then, that would, it just took over working full time just didn't work and even though I suppose because it was a creative writing job I was supposed to have time to write it just didn't happen for me and I had a bit of an epiphany after my dad died and realized I needed to leave my job and I didn't know how I was going to do it but I knew I needed to do it and with the redundancy money I built a writing shed at the end of our garden um, which is where I work now um, but also, the 5 a.m. club was the thing for me, and I wouldn't recommend the 5 a.m. club to anybody. <laughs> but um, when um, our son was small, um, sometimes I'd be staying up all night with him. And so it was like I approached 5 a.m. from the other direction. And I so sort of thought, well, when it gets to five o'clock, I can officially say it's morning and get up. I don't have to pretend that it's nighttime anymore. <laughs> so it was like a way of my brain structuring the time. And then when he was sleeping in for a bit longer, say till seven, my body was still waking up at five. So you might have heard me say this before, but then I had that like that slot when I didn't have any responsibilities and that really worked um, for a while. And then I sort of trans uh, sort of evolved into six o'clock. So I kind of do six till seven now. Um, yeah, and five. I, you must have been exhausted. Yeah, well, I, um, I didn't have an evening. I used to go to bed. So I'd go to bed at like nine. So the thing I missed out on was the evening, mm -hmm. which is why I wouldn't recommend it. Because <laughs> I think I started to miss my evenings. But yeah, so I the early morning slot is the thing that I do still. But if you'd gone back in time and told them me before I had um, our little boy... That I was going to start getting up at five I would have like you know I'd have laughed in my own face is <laughs> that meant for work but you know what I mean <laughs> I wouldn't I wasn't a naturally getting up at five person before before that happened um but there's something about first thing in the morning that's really quiet and you don't have any responsibilities and um or kind of you can forget that you do and you can just write um, and now I do a mix of editorial work and a little bit of teaching about four hours a week and some freelance writing and I self-publish some stuff and write fiction the rest of the time. In fact, this is the least structured my life's ever been and that is actually quite hard sometimes. 
So I think fun. um kind of everyone you've also got um different processes there which is really it's really interesting i'm endlessly fascinated about that how people actually get you know get the books out of them so that's um, and we've had a question in the q a box that um it's kind of related but it says how long does it normally take you to get the first uh, first draft done for a novel and that question's from steph um so yeah i mean i'm guessing that if you're Sharon, if you're writing three words a day, sometimes it might <laughs> it might take quite a while. I think how long is a piece of string? Yeah. The answer to that one. I mean, I was just going to say that it's funny how time just shifts all the time. You know, depending on where you are with your life, because um, you know my kids are older now. But when I first started writing the first draft of my first novel, uh, it was a little bit like Eve, and it's because my I've got three kids, but my first kids are twins, so. When I had my third child, who is a single child, um, I suddenly, and, and the boys, the twin boys went off to school because there's four years between them. I suddenly felt like I had a little bit of time when she was sleeping, you know, so I'd crazily mm -hmm. write in those that half an hour or hour then. Um, and I'd say that, the, you know, and that's when I sort of first started seriously writing a book. <laughs> uh, so it was a long time ago. And I think that first draft of that first book probably took, 10 years um you know because I think the first book is like that I think you put your whole life into it it's you know it's everything goes into that first book and you don't really feel like you're writing the first draft you just feel like you're becoming or trying to become a writer or trying to write um, so it's only in retrospect you realize that actually what that was was a first draft um, with the second book um Again, my kids were at school, so I had a little bit of time when they were at school, and um, and I and I had a publisher, so I had a deadline. So actually, I wrote the first draft of the second book quite quickly. So probably about fourteen months, which probably doesn't sound that quick to some people, um, but it's very quick for me. <laughs> anyway, I know some people can write a book every six months or every year, or but I'm not like that, so. Um, I have to kind of sit and compost for a long time and stay in space. Uh, so, yeah, so the third one is taking uh, a little bit longer, I have to say, but uh, I'm kind of blaming the fact that we had, we've had we had a global pandemic <laughs> in the middle of it. I think <laughs> you're allowed that, definitely. <laughs> the libraries were closed. <laughs> what was that? I said I blame the pandemic for most things these yeah. days. Anything that's not going well. <laughs> So I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sure everyone's got. No, it. no, it does. It's brilliant. Thank you, um, Eve. How about you? Do, um, how long does it take you to get a draft? Also, um, because obviously, Duckling is your first uh, book yeah. for grown-ups, and you, yeah. with the young adult stuff, are they are they generally shorter? Yeah, they are. They're a lot shorter. So, um, so my debut um, book was a um, teen book, so that was seven days. So that was that was short. I'm up about I think seven. Uh, I can't remember now, Six, 60,000 words, something like that. It might be a bit more than that. Um, and I wrote that in three months. That was really quick. Um, but I think part of the reason that was so quick was, I mean, I've been writing for a long, long time, a long time. I mean, I, my first book that I ever sent off was when I was seven. Um, I sent off to Penguin. So it's kind of like, I feel like I've gone round in a circle because my first book I ever sent off to Penguin at seven and I got rejected, but it was a lovely rejection. And they said, keep writing, don't give up. Um, and now I'm getting published by Penguin, you know, so you never give up. Um, have, you, have you spoken to them about it, Eve, since you've got, like, since the, <laughs> do they know that you sent to your booking when you were seven? I did tell them, yeah, I did tell them. I don't think they were that, you know, I think they probably thought, really? But yeah, it was a real thing. Muddles the mouse, I still remember it. Um, very good idea, actually. Maybe I should re revisit it. Um, <laughs> but it was done on a really clunky old tank writer and sent off. Um, and I've been writing, like, all the time since then, you know, dreams of dreams of stuff and taking ages over it. And um, my first sort of like attempt at an adult book was when I was working in an office and I was writing in my lunch hour, you know, back to going, how when did you write? This was a really pressurized job that I hated. And I would just go off in my lunch hour at the library at Croydon and I would sit and I would write, you know, and, and try and get this draft done. And that was that took about two years to get a draft done for that. I mean, it wasn't very good, but it was my first probably attempt at, at a book. Um, and then I was sending off, I wrote another book that I self-published in the end. Um, that probably took about six months. That was quite autobiographical. <laughs> 
back, if we're looking back, it's probably a bit about my mad life, actually, my mad family life. But I'd sent that off to agents, and that was an agent that she said to me, you should write for teens because you've got quite a young voice. And I was working in a school at the time, and I wanted to write about bullying because it was something I experienced. So I think it was because everything was coming together. So the idea came very, very quickly, and I could write it very, very quickly. So I was very lucky everything fell together at the right time. So my teen books, my young adult books, I tend to write between three to six months. Um, the smaller ones I can probably do in a month. Um, so I can get those out quite quickly. Duckling, I think I wrote the first draft in nine months. Um, so I usually um, I usually deliver a couple of books a year, but that's with children's books as well. So um, I am quite a fast writer, but it does bring other stresses with it. So, um, you know, like Sharon said, she can pass, she takes time. And I think that's a real lovely skill to have. Um, I think when you write books quickly, um, it can bring other stresses and things because you're constantly you know you're you're constantly sort of like trying to get this idea down I think sometimes you know maybe I do need to take back step and just take a little bit you know time to let it develop a little bit more in my mind I don't know so there are pros and cons to both processes but I'm just I mean as well you know sorry when you're saying that you've got um you know with two books a year does that mean you're kind of uh, in the middle of writing one you're editing another one have you got that juggle yeah well? yeah very yeah. often I'm very often writing two books at the same time as well so um sometimes I'll be writing one book in the morning and another book in the afternoon so I have to kind of switch my brain into but as long as it's a different that genre way. if it's a different genre I can do it right. so um if it's similar to genre, I wouldn't be able to do it, but if it's a different genre, I can do it because I can get into the, the character. But it does mean, can I just say that I have no social life, <laughs> that my house is an absolute tip, um, you know, that I am probably very ratty and, and not a very nice person to be around a lot of the time. So I do put a lot of pressures on myself by doing this. But I have this kind of thing in me, and I don't know where it comes from. I think it probably comes from my background, actually. I think it goes back to the working class thing again, um, of thinking that I'm not good enough, that this is all going to fall apart at any minute. So I'm constantly like trying to do it and get it out and churn it out before someone takes it away from me. So I think I do put a lot of pressure on myself as well. I think it does come from this big, big imposter syndrome that I carry on my shoulders a lot. So I think it is a bit of that, to be honest with you, um, because I do have this nagging voice that always says to me, this will go soon. So... Just get out what you can, while you can. I think you're amazing if you can, to, to be able to hold two stories, even though, you know, they're completely different, but in your head, while you were saying that, I was thinking, so if I try and read two novels at the same time, I get myself totally tied in knots and get the stories all interlinked and stuff, so I can only ever really read one book at a time, so to write two things, yeah, that's that's incredible. I don't know, Ella, does that say something about my brain? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> probably says something about me that we probably don't want to go into but I can read about four different books on the go as well so there probably is something psychologically wrong with me but we will go with it I can do it <laughs> all, all psychologically brilliant yeah. oh thank you thank you um Lou how about you then uh just the um uh, in terms of kind of time of getting drafts out well non-fiction I'm a lot more systematic um so over the last few weeks, I've been rewriting the nonfiction um, writing guides that I that I wrote a few years ago, and I've completely sort of gutted them and, and gone in again. And I realised that I was sort of not thinking of it like it was writing. <laughs> I was just ploughing through them and um, wasn't really emotionally attached to it. Um, and I was doing one a week. I mean, they're not they're not as long as my novels, but... It, it was it was like I was sort of able to let go of it because it was nonfiction. And when um, our son was small, he used to go to swimming lessons and I wrote one of my nonfiction books then in that chunk of time. And I don't know whether I would be able to do that with a novel. Whereas The Water's Edge, my first book, I wasn't writing full time, but I wrote it over 10 years, which is a bit different from writing a book in a week. <laughs> But I think it's because I'm. I was that was semi autobiographical because it was about someone who grew up in a hotel. Um, one of the non-fiction books that I self-published is called "Find Time to Write," and I added a bit. You know, I said I rewrote them. I added a bit about mental load, and there's a thing called um, 
emotional work or emotional labor that used to mean what in the 80s when it was first talked about it meant um the things that you have to do at work to keep your customers happy like smile at people and but it sort of evolved to mean other kinds of emotional work and actually we carry around that emotional work in our head as mental load and um I was writing about this thinking yeah of course I'm carrying around all this stuff I've actually got my life in my head and um that's possibly affecting why I can't um, why I need extra space around writing fiction. So I went to an Arvon retreat many years ago and I was writing 6,000 words a day. So it was like when I was totally unencumbered, I could do that, but I was exhausted by the end of it and I, there's no way I could have carried on with it. So I, I can actually write fast, but I, it's like I need lots of space around it. Um, and I think that's just my life, the context. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It gives you something to write about for a start. Um, but yeah, a lot of that mental load is emotional work. And I'm I'm part of a coaching program called Dream Author and it's run by Sophie Hanna. And she suggested that I try to get it all out of my head. So I, I fell over in the shower the other day really stupidly I have dyspraxia which makes me really clumsy sometimes and I really hurt the fingers on this hand and stupidly I sat down and um hand wrote my mental load down I thought oh I'll do this really quickly this will be fast <laughs> wrote down the categories like she'd suggested I was still there I was, like started first in the morning I was still there at lunchtime like Oh, I had like really bad hand ache from writing oh. all this down that was in my head and I thought no wonder I'm finding it hard to write stuff <laughs> because I'm also thinking about this um so yeah I, then I then 12 years to write one that hasn't been published The Haven actually my second novel about a year and a half that's probably the quickest and then I start I actually started planning up front this time with the novel that I've finished recently and that was a real epiphany because I wrote a 25,000 word plan and that took me quite a long time and then writing it was much quicker I can't tell you how long because I can't remember but it was quicker um and I hear other people talking about writing something in six weeks and I think yeah I could probably do that if I was like locked in a room somewhere and told I had to write a certain number of words or I wouldn't get fed like it would be possible <laughs> when you talk about the mental you know this kind of like mental load and carrying the kind of like the emotional side of all of the things as well there is yeah the, it's it's just life makes it difficult yeah. to concentrate solely on one thing and so when you're talking about being on an album retreat and being able to write six thousand words a day it's incredible to be able to do that because you're you're living and breathing writing aren't you and, yeah. and everybody's there for the same reason and um but that just is just not translatable to to real life unless, as you say, you you lock yourself away in a in a. I know everybody wasn't there for that same reason. I can remember going downstairs, having like feeling like I'd had this religious experience, having written six thousand words, and really looking forward to my nice meal. And there was a woman sat by the fire going oh, I'm really pleased with myself. I wrote 600 words today and then I went shopping. <laughs> and I was like really hoping to share this spiritual experience with somebody else. <laughs> yeah. It didn't happen. <laughs> but again, maybe it's like, what, you know, how Eve was describing it, having that, giving yourself that hour and having the most productive hour and then mm. having to step away from it. It's, it's fascinating how nobody, no two people have exactly the same process. Um, I just, well, yeah, I've, just, as I've got older, I've, I've noticed my different neurodivergences. I've known about my dyslexia for a long time, but I think I have symptoms of um, ADHD and I'm on the waiting list for the Asperger, uh, what used to be called Asperger's diagnosis. Mm. I've been on that for two years now, but I think I get into hyper-focus and I think that's where the 6,000 words in the day was coming from. And it's not necessarily healthy, but I think I, I didn't know that at the time. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you, you do need to have breaks. It's better not to just sit there and write all day in your pyjamas and not break for lunch, which is the sort of thing I would do when I was younger. But I can't do that anymore. I'm just, I'm, um, I can't believe how quickly this has gone. We're, we're nearly, we're nearly up to nine. <laughs> I'm just thinking, just given the, um, the um, all our different writing groups who are either watching it live tonight or um, will be watching the recording of it. 
in terms of for new writers or people who are yeah might, they're starting a novel or or are you know are brand new to writing you know if you had a, a bit of advice like what you'd give to yourself before you started do you have a do you have a pearl of wisdom that you could share with our groups um Sharon if we could start with you I don't know if I've got a pearl <laughs> of wisdom I mean I would, I would think I would say just don't be too hard on yourself you know I think everyone is different and uh, you know with word counts I just feel like a failure if I don't meet word counts although I, I do I do kind of have them in my head you know and on my wall planner things I've got to, and I think it's quite good to have things to kind of aim for um, but you know just just be kind to yourself because um, it's hard especially if you are literally writing around the kids and I know how I write now is very different to how I wrote 10 or 15 years ago when my kids were younger so you know things will change and your your process and your production will change with it so you know take it easy small steps um yeah that's what Brilliant. I'm saying and, and go swimming and go for a walk and get get have breaks as Lou's saying <laughs> you know, it's really important to have breaks yeah, so um, Eve, what would, what would your advice be to a new writer? Um, probably similar to Sharon's, actually. I mean, I'd definitely say, you know, you need to keep going. Don't let that rejection hang over you because you're going to get rejections all the way. Even when you publish, you get rejections, you know, whether it be for competitions or, you know, whether you get rejected for your new idea. It's a continuous thing. And I think it's, it's learning not to compare because I think it's such a hard industry sometimes. And... I think even when you're not published and you're, you're, you know, getting your work out there, you're constantly looking at other people and trying to see where you are. You've just got to concentrate on your own journey. And I always say it's like being on a motorway, you know, like you might be in some old, you know, old banger car and someone else is in a Porsche, like flying down the, you know, the whatever it is, the outer lane, and you're going chugging along. You might be going slower, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to get to your destination, not going to get to your destination. You might just take the scenic route and they might just go the fast route. You don't know. Everyone's journey is different. So enjoy it, you know, enjoy your journey and try and enjoy the moments of success. So whether that be you finish your book, you know, that's a success, enjoy it. Whether that be you win a competition, enjoy it. Own those moments and really, really enjoy it. And really, like Sharon was saying, you know, be kind to yourself and celebrate them. Because I think we're too focused as, as humans. We focus too much on the negative and the, the bad things that happen and we don't celebrate good things that happen. And, and one other thing as well, celebrate each other because um, being a writer is a very lonely um, and it can be quite an isolating task. So being part of a network like this is amazing. So celebrate each other, you know, be there for each other. Always, you know, endorse other writers if you can, that you like and you enjoy, um, because, you know, it's a way of just being part of that community and helping people appreciate authors and love reading even more. Oh, it's lovely, really lovely words, Eve. Thank you. And Lou, any, any final words from you? Yeah, I totally agree with what Sharon and Eva said. Um, I also agree about looking after yourself. You really need to put your self-care first before anything else. Um, but as this is about work-life balance, there are so many tips I could give you, but I'll give you this one. If you really can't find any time to write, if it's really impossible, then get one of those books of writing prompts. There's a book called The Five Minute Writer and there's a sequel called More, F More Five Minute Writing that's got really great ones in. Um, that's just an example. Get one of those and put it by your bed. And then last thing at night or first thing in the morning, you could just whenever you can, not necessarily every day, just write a paragraph. And that's still writing. And then when you've got a bit more time, you could do a bit more. Brilliant, Lou. Thank you. I really like that because then it, we talk about it as being like a muscle that you've got to exercise so yeah if you've got if you feel like you've got no time but you can whenever you can work that muscle it all helps um so yeah thank you everybody it's really really um yeah pleasure to hear all of your experiences and your um your tips for us so thank you very much thank you Thank you. Um, Thank you. We've got another panel which is coming up on the 16th of June, it'll be at 8 pm again. And then uh, on that one, we've got um, Jenny McLaughlin, Alexandra Benedict, and Kate Lee.
Um, so, and that is on finding inspiration. Did I just say that? Sorry, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> So uh, please sign up as well to our mailing list and follow us on all the social media um, things so that you can stay up to date with the projects. We've got some exciting stuff in the pipeline. So thank you to the Arts Council and to New Writing South. And that's it from us. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.